Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Passionate People and Preposterous Peeves. I'm your host, Ike. I'm here with Daniel Maybe. Say hello, Dan. Hi, how are you? I'm pretty good. Having a morning cup of joe at 9.30 in the a.m. Slight different uh, time change for you. What you up to? Oh, um, no, I'm just uh, enjoying a nice overcast rainy day sitting here smelling some incense and watching my cats wander around the room in terror. <laughs> Sounds terrific. You got a favorite dad joke? Uh, you know, I do. Um, though it, I guess that this is a bit more serious probably than most dad jokes. Um, what is a pirate's favorite letter? I'm going to guess R. Oh, he may think that matey, but his first love be the C. Oh, how could I forget such an important factor? You, you, you fell right into my trap. <laughs> Do you have a favorite underutilized word? Uh, indubitably, I do. And what is it? Indubitably. No! <laughs> Getting the old twofer in there. Uh, we need like a soundboard for when I'm landing <laughs> these great punchlines. <laughs> Hopefully, come around the time this gets published, I'll, we'll find one and stick it in. Okay. Do you have a movie that you'll never skip when channel surfing? Oh, geez. Um, well, the first one that popped into my head when you asked that question is Leon the Professional. I I, I think a lot of that comes back to the fact that that was a movie that was often on, you know, a couple decades ago when I was channel surfing. Chan <laughs> back when you had to? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's, um, I mean, that's, that's, that's one of the all-time... that greats for me that's that's certainly in my movie pantheon a lot of sure great a lot of great performances in that in that film yeah, iconic classic performances to be sure way ahead of its time too that i feel like that kind of movie just started coming back around relatively recently with like you know the grizzled you know anti-hero and this you know sweet young person that gets introduced to their world you know i actually just saw a movie last night on uh on netflix that that kind of follows that same path. Um, Polar? Uh, no, uh, Kate. Caked? Kate. Uh, K-A-T-E, like short for Catherine. Oh, okay, yeah. Some How of, was it? I actually really enjoyed it. I I, I came downstairs and my, my, my girlfriend was watching it uh, after I finished playing Dungeons and Dragons last night. Um, so I only caught the second half, but I really enjoyed it. Um, uh, the... Uh, a little synopsis uh it's a a child a young girl who's following around and being trained by uh an assassin uh a uh a a hit person if you were so uh there <laughs> there are there are some some similarities to the aforementioned leon the professional do you, have you watched leon the professional on tv and or like on network cable and like in its original form Yes. How big a difference is it when it's on TV? Because that one is definitely rife with dark material, to be sure. Um, you know, I mean, and I'm I'm having to reach back through the mists of time to answer this particular question, but I don't think that there's actually too too significant of a difference. Um, there, oh wow, there isn't there isn't a lot of you know, graphic, sexual content. And, you know, while it's dealing with heavy themes, there's not a lot of extreme violence. I mean, most of the really memorable scenes from that film are just two people getting to know each other alone in a hotel, or it, rather in an apartment. And, mm -hmm. you know, certainly none of that had to be edited out. Um, yeah. So while I'm sure there are some changes... Um, I think probably the parts that make the film great are still intact. If you were to watch it on USA or whatever, it's not, it's not Pulp Fiction. True. If you had to evacuate your house, what's the first thing you would grab? Um, my girlfriend for sure. All right. Assuming sentient animals know to get the heck out of harm's way. What do you grab? 
Um, probably my collection of Magic the Gathering cards. Do you have them all neatly set aside one specific thing that you could easily grab, or are you going to need to grab a, you know, a garbage bag and start shoveling? Well, they're, they're all organized into these uh, car- white cardboard boxes that are specifically designed for holding collectible playing cards. Um, so I would, you know, I'd, I'd probably be running out of the, out of the house looking like a cartoon waiter with <laughs> all, of, with all this stuff stacked up and kind of juggling them in my arms. But I think I could do it in one trip if, if, if the future of my nerddom depended on it. <laughs> I actually had to do that. Uh, were you still in, you, you had moved out of uh, the Sonoma area when the fires hit, right? You weren't there anymore? Well, it depends on which fire you mean. Um, are you talking about the one that took down like half of Santa Rosa? Yeah. Yeah, so that, that happened almost immediately after I left California, but I did have to come back on a business trip shortly thereafter, and I witnessed the the devastation that that, yeah, was... that, 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 that fire unleashed. Yeah, I, when that fire occurred, I had to do a similar thing of just like, thankfully I wasn't like in the process of, you know, laying out multiple decks worth of cards or anything like that. I was able to just easily scoop them up, but was, I, I realized that I'd left my computer and all my clothes behind when like finally got a moment to calm down and think rationally. So then an awkward slinking back into my own apartment in the cover of darkness to abscond them. But can, can I, can, can I ask you a question? And, uh, sure. you know, this is probably, we're probably going a little off topic here, but um, just a skosh. if you had, um, if you were in that situation and you only had time to grab one box, which box would you grab or, uh, I think it's the, probably the ones with lands in it lands. That's, that would have been my guess. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're separated in two boxes as I look at them now. And I think the one with lands is considerably more expensive. Let's say that your entire collection was broken up into every deck you've ever registered for a tournament. You could only save one of them. I mean, the answer still might be lands because it's like <laughs> the biggest. <laughs> Although I guess I haven't technically registered for that one for a tournament. So uh, <laughs> goodbye, goodbye, Tabernacle. You, yeah, um, you you go to grab your lands deck, and the like, fi- the fire demon is standing in the door, being like. It, I don't. <laughs> I, I don't think so, Isaac. You thought we have about, rules around here. <laughs> you, you thought about registering that one once, but you never did it. <laughs> I literally did recently, actually. Like, think about registering it. I was like, ah, and then I bailed. <laughs> and then I decided to play something else instead. That's funny. <sighs> Growing up, what was your favorite book? Um, nineteen eighty four. Jesus, very precocious kid with a dour outlook on the future, weren't you? When did you read that book? Uh, I think I read that book in fifth grade. Um, when I was a child, some things are starting to come together. Yeah, when <laughs> when I was a child, I don't know to what degree you and I have actually talked about this, but um, I, you know, I. I still consider myself to maybe be slightly above average intelligence, but when I was a child, I I was extremely advanced compared to my peers. Um, And a lot of my uh, self-identity got built up around that. So it was, um, it was really important to me to consume content and to do things that sort of reinforce this idea with myself that uh that i was a genius um and 1984 i think was was it was really the first book i ever read that elicited a a really strong emotional response in me and 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 really really changed the way that i think about the world i i still pretty vividly remember the mo the the moment where i i finished the last page of that book the first time I was yeah probably about 10 years old. I was sitting on the floor in my in my bedroom. And when I finished the book, I, I threw it across the room because I was so upset with the ending. And 
I what do you mean it's not happy? <laughs> right. And you know, to the to this day, I don't think that there's ever been any other piece of media that solicited such an immediate and powerful response in me, um, except maybe the Star Wars prequels when I first saw them. <laughs> <laughs> you but, were <laughs> but I but, in what in what way did it elicit a reaction from the Star Wars films? Well, you know, I was in a theater, and so I couldn't. <laughs> I you couldn't throw a book at the. I, at yeah, the screen. I I couldn't throw the movie screen um, across <laughs> across the theater, um, and you know, I also I certainly couldn't do it halfway through the film. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I was I was uh, I was disappointed. Even even um, young me had some had some pretty. Had some pretty high expectations that that were not met, even even as a a, a doe eyed twelve year old, or I guess I, I was probably in fourteen when that movie came out. What was the what were the things that bothered you about the prequels that much? Well, in anticipation of watching Episode One, I I was already a really big Star Wars nerd. I, I was first introduced to those movies by my friend Matt Cremines and in third grade um but in anticipation of the prequels of episode one i i had Im- immediately gone back immediately is the wrong word immediately before watching the movie i watched the original trilogy um i had cert- i had consumed all three of them in the 24-hour period before i went and saw episode one and the moment i mean that th- just the first scene of that movie it was immediately obvious to me that that it was tonally going to be so different from the original movies. Um, mm-hmm. I, it, 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 it just immediately changed my, my, my mindset. And I don't think I really gave it much of a fair chance after the first scene. I was, <laughs> I was, I was pretty sour and just waiting for any scene where Darth Maul could do something cool, which I, I certainly was delighted by the, the end of episode one is something yeah. I, I enjoyed then and still enjoy. Yeah. What comes to your mind when I say the word underrated? Um, <laughs> well, the, the first word that popped into my mind was subjective. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's uh, I mean, I think that it's a, it's, it's a dangerous path to go down trying to, trying to plant those flags um, on on culture, but if you're if you're g- gonna force me to do it, um, <laughs> I, I would say uh, going to bed early. Oh, interesting. Why why is that underrated for you? Do you think? Well, I think that you know a lot of people in my generation, the, anyone that grew up with technology and a a, a massive industry designed specifically just to reduce your boredom in exchange for money. Um, when you when 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 you get to the end of a night and all of your responsibilities are are done for the day, it's always so attractive to do any of the mir- miraculous things that are at your fingertips. Uh, with that free time, and you know, I, I would consider being able to watch virtually any movie ever made uh, in a moment a miracle. Um, mm. But if you if you do that over and over and over and over, it will, you know, it 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 will rob you of a lot of the joy that comes with actually taking advantage of those things. And it will rob you a lot of joy from the moments in your life that are supposed to be pleasantly mundane because you're tired. <laughs> and um, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, people, certainly myself included, but, you know, people in, in our culture, in our society as a general rule, don't put nearly enough value on how they're going to feel when they first wake up and put far too much value on what they're doing between the hours of midnight and 1am. 
Yeah, I absolutely agree, Dan, with the, you know, when in regards to like getting sleep, it was something I recently recognized was like the value of you know, it's something that and probably as of like maybe even just a year ago, I put the value on experience over sleep. And then probably within this last year, it's really started to come to a head where it's like, oh, like the amount you enjoy doing things when you're full rested versus the amount of extra things that you get to do when you're like, you know, running on fumes and how much you enjoy each of them. It really changes the changes the experience yeah, and makes it you're so much better off having, you know, slept instead of, you know, done that extra thing. Yeah, and you know this this um, this conversation, it it's really reminding me of something that I read um, when I was uh, going through uh, sort of a a journey of self improvement, trying to address s- some addictions that I have. Um, at the time, I was specifically really trying to address how much I was drinking, and. I just I read something on the internet where someone was saying that the way that they look at consuming alcohol or spending their time partying um, is that in any given week, let's say that you have a hundred happiness points, and when you spend a night binge drinking, you're compressing those happiness points into a very short time period, and then you're you have to deal with the fallout of that the next day and often several days after, you know, it has this sort of ripple effect throughout your life. And overall, your life will be a lot happier if you're able to enjoy every day and put, put less burden on your Saturday nights to make up for, you know, whatever perceived happiness is missing in your life. Yeah. It's it's the hardest thing to realize in the moment, but in like the abstract and the, you know, when removed from the situation, it does it gets a lot easier and it is it is definitely something that should be synthesized and like thought over. Right. The reward in my experience and it sounds like in yours is very like compelling of when you get like a full night's sleep as opposed to, you know, staying up and watching a movie for another 3 or 4 hours or, you know, when you Instead of drinking, you go to bed and you wake up sober and, you know, feeling good. Right. I mean, the, I can probably count the number of times that in my entire life that I regretted going to sleep early on one hand. But I can count the number <laughs> yeah. of times that I regretted staying up late on a hypergeometric calculator. <laughs> you know but we, yeah. we we continue to make these decisions and it's it's for most people i think it's a lifelong battle and we can just strive to improve yeah we're just looking to improve our win percentage in that right in that skirmish right and that begins by it, ta- by talking to better players yeah, exactly <laughs> <laughs> so in the same, in a similar vein to this last conversation, is there a piece of advice you've gotten over the years that you would say is the best or the one that you kind of go back to most frequently? You know, I don't know it, if this was a specific piece of advice that I was given at some point in my life or if this is a sort of platitude that I came up with on my own, but... I think that the the little nugget of wisdom, or I'm cl- I'm claiming that it's wisdom. Your mileage may vary, but the little nugget of wisdom that I think I go back to the most, that I think has the most b- beneficial um, impact, both on my day to day life and my long term mental health, is really remembering that for the most part, other people don't care about you. And I, I don't mean that in a, in a, in a empathetic way that other people don't care whether you are alive or dead or are happy or unhappy. I mean, I think for most people, a, 
a huge part of the anxiety and sadness that they deal with in their lives is obsessing about how they were perceived by others, right? Either at a specific moment in their life or over a long time span, you know, fear that other people don't like you or dealing with shame or embarrassment. And really when, you know, me personally, when I think about someone who did something embarrassing, that is only a, a, a fleeting thought in my mind. And the idea that someone could be torturing themselves sometimes for years over this kind of thing, it, it makes me really sad. And I think that to a degree, our society has really, you know, normalized that sort of shame, right? And, and, yeah. and, 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 and people don't take actions to overcome that part of themselves, because society tells us that it's something that everyone experiences, but it doesn't have to be that way. And, you know, I think that any time that someone spends really, really trying to learn what's worth being anxious over um, will improve their life at least as much as going to the gym. If not more, if, yeah. If not more, right? So my, um, you really reminded me of a book I read that was recommended to me, recommended to me by my brother. Uh, it's called "I Thought It Was Just Me," um, but it isn't. Uh, it's by Brene Brown. Um, I would highly recommend if <laughs> if anybody felt that <laughs> what Dan just said hit hit them like a ton of bricks like it did me, I would really recommend that book because it, it really does kind of go into that idea of shame and like just on off the cuff remarks or not so off the cuff remarks from other people and how we internalize them as human beings and all that. It is truly like mind altering when it comes to, you know, like perceiving the way people, the way we interact and what we take as baggage and what we take as kind of definitive slights when they actually, you know, aren't like you said, like most people don't actually care. It's not, you know, it's not something intentional. N nobody's looking, very few people are looking to, you know, metaphorically stab you when they interact with you. Right. And I mean, if they are, fuck them. <laughs> yeah. How, how that affects you is ultimately still within your control. If you have the yeah. right skills yeah. to control it. I'd actually, yeah. if I if I could, I'd like to tell you another little story in this same vein. Yes, please. Um, so, I I believe you know this, but I have a I have a a, a fairly I don't know if extreme is the right word. I I have a fairly intense. I have OCD pretty bad. I've I've been medicated for it all of my adult life, and one of the one of the issues that has been sort of always present in my life because of obsessive compulsive disorder is that I have a, a, a powerful aversion to stickers or anything that, anything that could conceivably get stuck on me. So this includes, you know, anything that's wet and lightweight or anything adhesive. Um, and the, the sort of response that it, it triggers inside of me is very similar to what a quote unquote normal person's response might be when they, when they see like a spider, right? Mm -hmm. on, on the wall across the room. Odds are that spider can't hurt you. And in fact, in, in many cases, you probably intellectually know that that spider cannot hurt you and that mm -hmm. it's not going to leap across the room and land on you. Right. But for a lot of people, it fills them with this irrational revulsion, anxiety, fear, right? It, mm. it, it has to be addressed before they can keep watching America's Next Top Model or whatever, right? <laughs> Not and, pulling from personal experience or right. anything. <laughs> and, and that's kind of how I felt about stickers. And if someone has a fear of spiders, we're not, we're not trained that you need to go to therapy about this, right? Like... Every, yeah. Everyone is afraid of spiders. They don't come up that much in your life. The only difference between my fear of stickers and your fear of spiders is that not everyone is afraid of stickers, right? So if I, 
if I demonstrate this this negative public response to you know having to put a band aid on, uh, I'm sort of taught that that's not normal, right? Yep. And so I I took it upon myself to address this fear, this this revulsion, if you were, and I I really sort of dedicated it dedicated myself to 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 tackling this fear with the same you know passion and intensity that I would put into you know something that was really really important you know like the the doctor told me that if I don't bring my blood pressure down by however much that you know it's going to take years off my life or something I made it a really central focus of my life and I won't say that I'm completely over it but when I got to the other side of that obsession, it was like my mind had had a, a weighted blanket removed from it. I didn't really mm. realize how much mental energy I had tied up in navigating the world in a way that avoided this trigger for me. Yep. And, and once I didn't have to do that anymore... I felt powerful. I felt like I was, you know, it's hard to say it in a way that doesn't sound, you know, sort of cheesy, but I felt like almost sort of enlightened. And, you know, Mm -hmm. stepping back, I think that, you know, public speaking or, or fear of public shame or embarrassment, I think it's really a very similar fear to spiders or, or for me, you know, stickers, band-aids, wet hair, whatever. (laughs) It's something that you, you know, you see it, you're in the moment and you, people just get this irrational, you know, terror in their, in their stomachs and, and, you know, they will obsess about it. But the reality is it's just like the spider on the wall a very small percentage of them might be poisonous. And if that's the case, maybe you'll wander near it or it will get away and bite you. But most people live their whole lives without that ever happening while continuing to be afraid of spiders. (laughs) And I, I think that if you can apply that same logic to, to, you know, this, this concept of social shame that it will be an enormous improvement in people's lives. I mean, certainly I have to encounter stickers more than I have to encounter spiders, but I have to encounter difficult or important social interactions far more. And, you know, and in, in fact, they're, they're central to what drives my happiness in every aspect of my life, you know, with my friends and my girlfriend and, strangers at a concert and in my professional life and Mm -hmm. that experience really made me the experience of overcoming my anxiety about stickers really helped sort of unlock this uh new i'll call it a, a new perspective when it comes to all of these other little hidden things in our lives that are acting as, you know, the ankle weights on our brains and on our happiness that we have just been trained either by evolution or by our culture to just accept and not address because, hey, everyone gets embarrassed. Everyone is afraid of talking to their boss about something uncomfortable. So it's okay that you are too. And if you are, I'm not not telling you that you're not okay or that there's something wrong with you. But I'm telling you that your life could be better if you ad- address these things that you perceive as normal, even if they're negative. Yeah. And it, it the fact that it is normal, I think, helps is like one of those things to be focused on, too, because the the most difficult thing about shame and about fear that we don't is that we don't talk about it. Yeah. Because, you know, it's something we're afraid of and therefore shamed about or, you know, what other inconvenience and therefore we're shamed about it. So it, it is like 
the most important thing is talking about it with somebody else, trained professional or understanding friend and realizing you're not alone. That's like the most, that is like one of the biggest things I've gotten out of therapy is that, yeah, you're not the only person that does this. You're not weird. This is normal. You know, it's normal to be afraid of spiders. There's plenty of other people that have OCD about sticky things. You're not alone. This is not something that you should be ashamed of. You're, you're not this, you know, a uh, tragic snowflake who is alone in this peril. You know, that, this is part of the human experience. Not everybody's is the same, obviously. So, you know, like not everybody's going to understand you, but there are people out there who have, you know, went through similar difficulties. You can do this. It's, you know, it's not something, it's not a sentence that can be removed from your shoulders. It's something that you can, you know, if you want to and put in the time you can overcome. Right. Absolutely. It, I mean, I would be, I would be far pressed to look at anyone and tell them that there was something wrong with them, but yeah. there are many things that are a part of them that maybe they would want to change. Yeah, yeah. There's, it, it's something that can be fixed. It's not. It, it's something that can be made better. It's not something that like is actively bad necessarily. Right. Do you have a favorite anecdote you like to tell? Oh, gosh. Um, uh, I'm going to take you back in time to 2004. Stepping um, in the time machine. Yeah. At, so right. at, the, uh, at the time, I was a senior in high school. Um, I, I, I think that the, the, this story actually took place the summer after I graduated. But um, at the time, I was a very heavy smoker, uh, approaching two packs a day never start smoking kids. And I, I had really gotten into spicy foods, Um, you know, heavy smokers, uh, their, their, their taste buds aren't, aren't as strong and they can handle spicier foods. And I, I had, I had come to realize that I could handle a lot more than most people. And I, I, you know, sort of took a, a whimsical pride in that and, I had another, I had a friend from uh, back in my live action role playing days um, named Matt, who, while he was overseas, I, I'll be honest, I don't recall if this was in Iraq or Afghanistan, but while, while, while he was overseas, he was on, t- uh, he was riding in a military vehicle that went over an improvised explosive device and was thrown from the device, or sorry, thrown from the vehicle and suffered a traumatic brain injury. It's <laughs> a great anecdote so far, right? And um, popping off. He was in a coma, you know, got shipped back, sh- shipped back home. The the president came and met him after he woke up. And after he re- after Matt recovered and you know, I'm I I'm I'm happy to say that Matt made it almost full recovery and went on to um, be a writer for Wizards of the Coast, making Dungeons and Dragons books. Um, awesome. Yeah. Uh, when I when I first met up with Matt after um, after his accident, you know, the he had a, he had a large scar on his head, and I noticed there were little parts of his personality that were different, and you know that was interesting. I I was pretty young; I had never met anyone in that sort of situation before, um, but. For the purposes of this particular story, what was really interesting to me was that Matt couldn't, he had completely lost his sense of taste and his, and his sense of smell. But he had come to realize that if he put hot sauce, very hot hot sauce on stuff, that I don't know if, if, if he could really taste it, but it would give him a sensation that was mm-hmm. pleasant and sort of, you know, scratch, <laughs> scratch this itch that was... Um, that was yeah. inside of him because he couldn't taste food anymore. And so the night of this particular anecdote, I was over at Matt's house and, Oh, I, I guess I should back up one more time. A local, um, East coast craft hot sauce company had heard about Matt's story. And as a, you know, as a, as a PR stunt probably, or, or, you know, maybe, maybe out of a, a genuine, desire to uh to you know support an injured veteran 
they gave him a a lifetime unlimited supply of all the products that they made. So oh, wow. yeah, right. And so when I went over to Matt's house the, the, on this fateful evening, uh, I saw that Matt had he had a full bar at his house. He 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 was uh, he, he had a nice house and it was. I was very impressed, but, but, but the bar was, um, it wasn't an alcohol bar. It was a hot sauce bar. So behind, <laughs> b- behind the bar were all these bottles with different labels, different sizes and shapes of different types of hot sauce. And I saw that and I thought, well, okay, you know, it, <laughs> this is pretty cool. And, um, I was pretty drunk already when I showed up. And so I, I approached them and I, you know, I said, Matt, I want to try your hottest hot sauce. And, um, you know, he looked at me and I don't remember if he tried to talk me out of it or what, but he gave it to me and I'll never forget this. He, he pulled, he pulled out this, this little bottle. It was, um, just read death. Yeah, it was, it, (laughs) it, it was a little glass bottle, maybe about the size of a pill bottle. And it, it had one of those stoppers on top with like the rubber, uh, bladder that you depress and then release it and it pulls the liquid up into this mm-hmm. metal tube, you know? Um, it, the product was called Devil's Icker. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it looked exactly like used motor oil. <laughs> and I, I would later come to discover that the, inten- <laughs> the intended use of this stuff was to drop a few drops into like a gallon of water and you <laughs> and, and use it to cook like huge meals right like or or if you were making if you were making uh you know industrial quantities of chili like this would be a, yeah. this would be the way to give it some kick right but i in my this is meant in, for a robust kitchen yeah, not of the like industrial grade not of like the <laughs> right, pop right. and so this uh, we put it i got a tortilla chip to put it on and i you know just sort of squirted this <laughs> this this like viscous you know uh sludge onto the this the, this this viscous dark oily sludge onto the chip and just sort of popped it into my mouth and <laughs> that's, regretted it forever. Well, so <laughs> that that moment in the story is really where my sort of clear memory ends. <laughs> and and so the, you know, the we'll say that we'll say that that's the first act of three. So during <laughs> during this second act. I have very hazy memories, just little flashes, but um, evidently, after I ate the chip, um, immediately, um, you know, uh, uh, fluids began <laughs> began rapidly issuing out of out of my eyes and my nose and my mouth. Um, and I, w- I was let outside so I, so I could get sick. And I guess, I guess I should also say, I had showed up to my friend's house with, sorry, to my friend Matt's house with my buddy Robert, and Matt was busy playing D and D with 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 some of his friends. He Matt was a little bit older than me, so while we were friends, we weren't we weren't really close friends. Um, so he he was playing D and D, so he was too busy, you know, you know, after everyone got their laughs. <laughs> seeing, see, seeing what was seeing what had happened to me, he was too busy to tend for me. So, his, his wife was gracious enough to sort of set me up um, at at their kitchen table with a bowl of milk <laughs> for me to sort of sob into, um, <laughs> you know. And she would she would she would check on me to make sure I wasn't drowning or whatever. Um, and eventually, I just fell asleep at the table. Well. Eventually, my buddy Robert comes and gets me. He wakes me up, um, and he says, "Dan, you know what? It's 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 time to go." And I'm like, "You know, okay." You know, he was the designated driver. I was the I was the drunk one. And before I left, I went 
I went to pee. <laughs> and you know, maybe you can see where this is going, but at, 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 at some point, some residue from the devil zicker had made it onto my hands. Oh, no. <laughs> and so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm probably, you know, I probably get back to the door of the bathroom before, you know, all hell breaks loose below my belt, right? Uh, it's, 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 it, it, it felt like my genitals were being microwaved (laughs) and, you know, I came out and I was in a panic, you know, but, um, I was also, you know, clearly delirious and incoherent. So Robert, (laughs) Robert couldn't he didn't he didn't he didn't under completely understand what was what was going on with me or if he did understand he didn't truly grasp the gravity of the situation which which was quite severe and so he loaded me up into his passenger seat but the the pain is becoming more and more intense and this is this is kind of where act two ends everything from here on out i i I only know the details because Robert relayed them to me later with great relish, but <laughs> apparently I, you know, I, I sort of descended into this, you know, complete gibbering, suffering lunacy. Um, I, we cranked the air conditioning on full blast. He had this you know, old two, you know, probably 2000 X Terra that had these, these super powerful air conditioners <laughs> and we, we, we had it blasting down my shorts, but that wasn't enough. So <laughs> I took my pants off and in my delirium, I was like, I, I mean, I was like smashing my head against the window of his car <laughs> screaming and he didn't want his window to break. So he, so he rolled it down and I, and I just, and I, I have no explanation for this detail, but he, you know, his car was full of trash the way that any, 18 year old's car might be and um i just started like chucking trash out the window and i was <laughs> i was just i was just pleading with him for 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 help whatever that whatever that may mean right and so eventually he pulled off on this at this 7-eleven that was uh you know one of the many 7-elevens that that dot the map of highways the the maze of highways in uh, northern virginia and, um, you know, he got, um, a huge, you know, whatever the biggest, cheapest bottle of cold water he could. And he brought it to me in the car and I, you know, I dumped it all over myself, um, without getting in his car with, or without getting out of the car, which he was pretty upset about. Um, <laughs> and then I just kind of, I mean, I, I guess that doing that provided me some amount of, some amount of relief because I was able to fall into this sort of fever sleep in his <laughs> in his passenger seat you know, the, from from what he told me i was fully out you know not not responding to stimuli in any way but i was i was still crying and 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 whimpering and sort of you know shifting around um and he 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 drove me home and when we got home, he, he wasn't able to rouse me. And so he, he, he had to carry me up two flights of stairs to, the, to where my bedroom was. <laughs> on the, and Robert's, Robert's a big, strong guy. I don't, I, I don't think very many 18-year-olds would have been able to carry you know, my 240-pound self at the time. But he, he got me up the stairs to my, to my bedroom in my parents' house and laid me down to sleep. And... Um, in the morning, I, I, there was some peeling, but um, <laughs> but with you know, I got I got some creams or some ointments, some some kind of gel, and I healed up pretty quickly. But um, that's that, amazing. That was yeah. So that's my experience with Devil Zicker. And if you ever get an opportunity, <laughs> I highly recommend. I, I, no, <laughs> I, I I highly recommend it. I mean, what if you ever have to go? on a podcast oh. someday and are, are put on the spot about a memorable anecdote there, there, there you go. You, you, you have your, your problem solved personal <laughs> double zipper story. Oh man. 
Oh wow, that was that was more than I could have ever hoped and dreamed. Speaking of dreams, if you could guarantee one of your dreams would come true, which one would it be? Oh gosh, um, I mean, I I I guess the one where I become, you know, sort of an omnipotent, um, you know, God Emperor of the world. You know, I've uh. I, uh, I, am, stickers are banned. Everybody's got to sleep at least eight hours a day. Yeah. You know, um, you know, I, I live forever and eat nothing but cheese and, you know, get, get, <laughs> get to, get to fly around and, you know, everyone does <laughs> what, what kind I of says. cheese are you, what kind of cheese are you eating? I'm the God emperor, Isaac. How, <laughs> How dare, how dare I have the how, insolence to ask such a question? How dare you subject me to your <laughs> trivial <Pedestrian>. wonderings? <laughs> I'm, and you know what? Because we're, you know, because we're old friends, I'm not going to have you curled into the sun. <laughs> I, I will let you choose the manner of your execution, <laughs> as long as it's within the next five minutes. <laughs> no 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 dragging it out okay i saw survived to the year of 111 and i uh, die after having the best day of my life all right so that's that's a that's a great answer but <laughs> i meant i meant your death is in the next five minutes so because ah, because oh, okay. because you're clearly not taking this seriously i'm gonna have to <laughs> curl you into the sun <laughs> but I'll build a monument to you. <laughs> Made out of cheese. If you could work any of the jobs that you've worked over the course of your life, but get paid the same as the job where you made the most, which job would you work? I would do what I'm doing now. Yeah? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the company that I work for right now is, I've been working for them for eight or nine years, and, and I guess... I don't know if they were my first, you know, real grown-up job, but the, you know, it was my first job that didn't begin with customer service. You know, my my first real desk job, if you will. And early in early in my career at this company, you know, to me it was really just a job, a paycheck to get through the day. But I'm at the point now where I really kind of feel like I have a unique set of skills and I'm, I'm able to make a real positive impact in, in, in people's lives, even if it's in, you know, my own little way by, by, by doing this one thing well. And, you know, if my only options are the things that I've done before, you know, certainly delivering pizzas was lower stress, but did have that self that sense of satisfaction. Yeah, you know, now now that I'm older, I'm I'm really better at getting a sense of satisfaction and self value out of things that maybe weren't, you know, the really exciting things that I wanted to do when I was a when I was a kid or when I was a teenager. You know, I I think a, mm -hmm. a lot of people that grow up in our culture sort of struggle with this moment where, like, am I gonna am I gonna follow my dreams and 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 live a life that is almost guaranteed to be fraught with more you know a lot more struggle and 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 difficulty than if they were to mm -hmm. work you know a quote unquote regular job and early in my life i really sort of trapped myself in this box where i was like you know because i'm working this job that isn't sexy I'm not going to get any any feelings of of self value out of it, and mm -hmm. that did you know that mindset it did have some positive impacts on my life. You know, I was still determined to get a feeling of self value. I think that that's why I got into creative writing, and it's it's why I have always been so so passionate about my hobbies. But man, if you're gonna live in this society and live a comfortable life you're going to spend a lot of time at work and um learning i guess the value of what i was doing and what it meant for 
who I was and how I affected other people's lives, that's maybe not something that I had the maturity to appreciate when I was younger because it wasn't cool. Mm -hmm. But I don't feel that way anymore. And um, I'm, you know, that being able to sort of love that part of my life has been a, a big positive change for me in, in, in the past, sit and call it three, four years of my life. That's awesome. Yeah, that is, that's something I'm, I'm going through right now as well to a, a different extent, but in a similar vein of trying to, you know, reason with reality basically. But I, I definitely know how you feel on that one. That is, you hit me where I live. Going from uh, good, good changes or you know good mindset changes to regrets. Is there anything that you regret not having done or tried before you graduated high school? I think that I had a much more positive high school experience than most people. Um, I was really, I really enjoyed high school. Um, looking back. I mean, I don't think I can give you a, a, a real specific answer. I, I, I kind of did everything that I wanted at the time. I, I do regret maybe not taking my academics more seriously, but it's hard to go down that road because a lot of what I enjoyed about high school was really enabled by the fact that I didn't take academics seriously. Fill in the blank. This weekend was so great. I spent 13 hours doing... Doing something new with my girlfriend. What's something you see in someone else that makes you want to be their friend? Earnestness. Ooh. Good word and good quality. Is there something that you wish you had started sooner that you do currently? Eating healthy. Eating healthy? Yeah. Got to have them veg. On the flip side of that coin, what do you wish you had ended sooner? Smoking cigarettes. How long are you sober at this point? Is that the right word these for cigarettes? I, guess I don't so, know. Right? I don't know. Um, well, so I still vape. I'm, a, I'm actually about to begin Chantix. What is Chantix? Chantix is a relatively new drug that basically blocks the little nooks and crannies in your brain that nicotine hooks into so that mm. you no longer derive pleasure from consuming nicotine. Oh. If you could go back in time and tell yourself one sentence, what would it be and when would it be? I mean, this is the most stereotypical answer imaginable. But I think I would just encourage myself to be an early investor in cryptocurrency. <laughs> yeah. I buy was hoping you'd go with a little bit more nerdy and be like, buy all the black lotuses and just bury them. <laughs> bury them in a vault. You know, I've put a lot of thought into that kind of thing, and I worry that if I were to go back in time and buy all of the world's black lotuses, that that would just suppress uh, the yeah, popularity of magic. You'd have to only buy like 30 or 40%. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would probably give myself some financial advice. Uh, yeah. Or honestly, I would probably caution myself against ever gambling. That would be better. <laughs> yeah, that's a <laughs> it's a different kind of financial <laughs> uprising, I suppose. <laughs> Just take these like <laughs> gambling weights off your feet and see how fly your see how far your Icarus could fly. All right, we're circling the wagons. What's the most bizarre fact? What's the most bizarre fact you know to be true? Okay, I don't remember the exact number, but it's it's around one hundred. It's 102, I think. Um, but if you fold a piece of paper in half, standard paper, mm -hmm. in, in half 102 times, 103 times, it would be thicker than the observable universe. <laughs> and like what, the, the most amount of times is like seven or something like that, right? The most amount of times that, that, that physically we're able to do it it it's it's something yeah along those lines i think it takes 42 folds to get to the moon <laughs> to, to the distance between the earth and the moon correct jesus uh, a a uh 
a a similar one. This is a this is funny. I'm sorry, I'm diving into multiples now. Um, but there are more unique combinations to a deck of 52 playing cards than it is believed there are atoms in the universe. That is truly mind-boggling. Yeah. All right, I'm going to be thinking about that for the whole entire first ad break. Speaking of ad break, if you can make sure listeners of this podcast heard one song, which song would it be? So I had an answer queued up that we that that we had discussed but i'm actually um i'm actually going to change it uh something that you said earlier um inspired me uh i'm going to go with a song called other voices by lcd sound system Ooh. all right well we're going to throw it to our first ad break so full, feel free to stick around for that or Go listen to other voices by LCD Sound System and then come right back because when we come back, we're going to go to the passionate side of the pod. See you in a bit. Do you ever find yourself doing a mundane activity with nothing to keep you from gouging your eyes out or sticking a pencil through one ear and out the other? Uh Uh-huh. Well, then perhaps I could introduce you to music. Music comes in a variety of different types, flavors, and colors. Theorists say that it's the best thing to introduce to your life since food. So go out. And get some and make your life just a little bit more bearable. All right, folks, welcome back. Thanks for coming back, sticking around, or doing whatever you did. So, Dan, what is your passion? Well, um, so when you originally asked me this question, I um, wanted to frame it as learning. <laughs> but once, once we dug down more into it... Um, I believe that the definition that, that, that we landed on is trivia. I mean, learning's not wrong, but I think trivia is just a little bit more succinct when it comes to, you know, what it is. Well, you explain and the people can make up their own mind. Well, so I, the way I still view it is that um, I really just love learning about new things. I, I really, uh, I recently went back to school and, um, I'm learning about all, all sorts of new stuff with computers and statistics, and I'm really enjoying that. But, you know, when left to my own devices um, for fun at home, I will often just end up cruising Wikipedia trying to learn, you know, usually about history or science, um, just pulling information off the Internet. And, uh, you know, uh, I think the you know, the... <laughs> The way that this manifests in in my day to day life, by far the most, is is just pulling out little bits of trivia for people. Um, but really, if we're asking about what the passion is, I think it extends, you know, all the way back to when I was a child. I I loved learning about my multiplication tables and the persnickety rules of the English language. So, well. That's a cool place where it began, but what what is it mostly now? Because it sounds like when we were talking about it before the show, so, you know, sorry for the folks that we didn't capture it, but it it sounds like it was, like, now it's kind of more involved into the things you're learning don't seem to be that functional compared to, like, learning multiplication tables. It sounds like it's more, you know, intrigue and fun factoids and stuff like that, like, we end up talking about basketball plenty and like, there's like fun basketball stats you love to know, which right. are really cool. But the, unless you are training to be on who wants to be a millionaire or jeopardy, these facts don't really have any interplay in your life. Right. Well, so the, the tendency tends is that um, the information that I pursue is more, you know, what you're talking about, things like basketball statistics or war history. But that has that has less to do with the fact that that's what I really want to know about and more to do with the fact that that information has a really low barrier of entry. You know, you read it, you know it, you don't have to study for a year to, you know, to understand higher concepts. Um, and... You know, when I'm when I'm doing something for leisure, 
it it's I guess what often begins me pulling a thread is a question that pops into my head in my day-to-day life, which is often going to have to do with, with pop culture. Um, but if instead of Wikipedia, there was a, there was a free interactive, you know, course that, you know, could teach you about higher level math, um, you know, may, maybe I'd be interested in that as well, and and maybe that maybe that does exist. Um, it probably but, does. <laughs> the internet is I, a very large place. But I've I've never found one that um, that that will teach me sort of more academia in a way that is as fun for me in the moment, right? Mm-hmm. So it's 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 kind of like you know, Isaac, you love movies, right? Yeah, that's right? That, that's fair Mo- to say. <laughs> yeah. You know, do you spend most of your time when you're watching movies watching the, you know, the most critically acclaimed, intense movies? You know, or or I mean, I mean, maybe you're a bad example, but I think <laughs> I, I I think that when most people sit down to you know just do leisure on a Wednesday after a long day at work. They're not sitting down and watching The Departed or Schindler's yeah. List. You know, they're they're not watching something where you need to really think about it. Yeah. And trivia is the way that I can sort of scratch the learning itch without all the work. Without really having to think about it a lot. That makes sense. When do you think you really start to realize how much you loved this like aspect of yourself of like just finding out new information, whether it be useful, whether it just be kind of, you know, um, trying to think of a good word. Uh, yeah. What, when do you think you found that like your love for just learning, I guess? Sure. And um, so I think that this kind of ties back to something that we talked about in the first segment. Um, but you know, when I, when I was a child, it was it was really central to my to my self worth to feel like I was the smartest person in any given room that I was in, and as a result, I consumed huge amounts of books. Um, I taught myself higher level mathematics, and I read books on game theory, and I read classic literature, and I got I I got a lot of satisfaction out of just knowing that I knew those things and that I completed doing these things that, you know, many adults go their whole life without ever really doing. Um, and to a degree, I feel like, you know, though those feelings sort of just naturally carried over, or I guess it's probably easier to say that I just got good at it. I felt like I got, I got good at learning and I got almost addicted to feeling like I was improving myself by doing something that I was naturally good at. Um, so what has continued? What, why do you still continue when it sounds like you realize that that idea of being smarter than everyone else is, it sounds like that idea for you anyway, has kind of gone by the wayside. And if that's fair or accurate to say, then what has continued your passion of learning going forward without that, impetus like kind of pushing it along well i i I guess you could kind of relate it to someone who got really into fitness when they were young maybe for the wrong reasons maybe for body image issues but as an adult who you know they've worked through that but they still have this really fit body you know they're good at exercising and certainly working out and you know, working on yourself is an improvement. And so I, I think that, you know, even if maybe I, what started me down this path wasn't, wasn't the, uh, you know, maybe the, the noblest or best reasons. Um, I, I'm someone that can kind of go to the mental gym without dreading it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and and you know already tasting the endorphins that you get after you finished your hour long run and it's just not that difficult for me mm-hmm. so 
it, you know, even if I'm, I'm not necessarily doing it to justify my existence anymore, it's something that, that I can derive, you know, legitimate feelings of, of growth from while simultaneously feeling like I'm engaging, indulging in a, a leisure activity. Mm-hmm. And, um, I think I'm, you know, I'm lucky to have that. M- most of the, I think like most people, most of the leisure activities are about as far from, that that I enjoy are about as far from self-improvement <laughs> as, <laughs> as, as you can get. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's learning is a nice break from the sea of, you know, consuming brainless media and you know, drinking old fashions. <laughs> so when you're learning something, does your level of enjoyment matter on the difficulty? Like if something's easy for you to pick up or, you know, just information versus like, say something that's like really kind of above your easily, you know, kind of um, just understanding level. Like, you know, it, I get, I, for example, because words fail me, apparently, uh, like addition and random factoids and calculus, are those all three like the kind of same to you when it comes to like learning or is do you enjoy the calculus and not the others or vice versa? Um, I would be hard pressed to say that I don't get more enjoyment out of learning something that was challenging for me. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter, right? Okay. Like to 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 bring it back to the to the to the to the gym example. If I was someone that was in really good shape, yeah, I would love running marathons, right? Mm-hmm. But I'm not doing it. I'm not staying in shape so that I can run marathons. I'm That's staying just in like shape a byproduct. because it helps me love myself. And occasionally, if I'm really feeling like it, I can. Mm-hmm. You know, I. I can sit down and 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 learn higher level math, higher level science, or hold a lot of often meaningless information in my brain, um, just because I've practiced. I hit the mental gym almost every day my entire life. Is there a, is there a bit of knowledge or? Um you know, a field that you've tried to learn and have been unable to, you know, attain? Well, I mean, I think that, (laughs) I guess I'll immediately go to the most cliche imaginable example, but um, it is, I think it's hard for anyone to wrap their head around particle physics and how, how our understanding of, you know, uh, large objects astrophysics and classical physics and and particle quantum physics all tie together um but seemingly operate under under different rules um i you know by by no stretch have i delved into you know phd level mathematics but um to this point in my life, um, I guess I'll go a little humble brag. I still haven't really encountered anything with math that was really a struggle for me to wrap my head around. Um, when you ran into particle physics, did that not like change your relationship with this passion, but did it kind of throw it out of whack a little bit? Or was that is that part and parcel? Like, does this does not being able to learn something or having a very difficult time and not really grasping it, does that diminish how much you enjoy this part of yourself? Um, no, Uh, I'm going to just, I'm just, I'm going to just keep harping on this, um, on this, uh, gym metaphor. (laughs) But, you know, if I go into the gym and I struggle to lift a weight and I can't do it. Would I, when I'm leaving the gym that day, would I, would I feel better if I had lifted it? Yeah, probably. 
but it has no bearing on my love of doing it. And I, I, you know, I leave the gym knowing that if I keep trying to lift that weight, I probably could. Now, will I? I don't know if for whatever reason, understanding that becomes really important to me, maybe I will. Um, but I don't, I don't experience a, a sense of failure and I don't, I don't have any sort of like powerful need to understand it, you know, mm-hmm. just because I don't understand particle physics as well as I would like, that doesn't mean that I didn't learn and grow from the time I spent trying hmm. and it still expanded my, you know, the way I look at the world. Which and that's really the uh, you picked up some amount of something. That's not, really the goal. Yeah. Is there a misconception that you think the wider world has about learning and especially kind of things that aren't you know super, like th- there's learning things that you need to know either for graduating school or for your job, but it sounds like most of this stuff that you enjoy learning is not necessarily super important to your work or to you know necessarily getting through school as much as it is just obtaining new pieces of information, whether it be trivial or, you know, particle physic. I, is there... I, I think I need you to rephrase you, that question. So when talking to people about their passions, a lot of the time, th- this one's a little bit, I don't want to say mainstream, but it's a lot more used by more people. So it's less likely for there to be a misconception. But like, for instance, we both share the pastime of magic. And when you talk to people about magic, they're, they have many misconceptions about it being demonic, being, you know, having, being fraught with gambling or, you know, there's a lot of things that they don't understand because they're not part of that sphere. Sure. So this might be a little bit different because everybody learns something at some point, but the way you kind of approach it, do you think there's a misconception about learning as a general concept by the wider world? Absolutely. Um, I think that a lot of people fall into this trap and this goes back to, you know, talking before about feeling, you know, what we talked about before, feelings of embarrassment, social shame. But people fall into a trap of feeling like if they don't know something, that's a reflection on them, especially when it's something that they perceive is common knowledge. But this is something I actually feel pretty strongly about. So just look up XKCD number 1053. And that is what I feel people should know about learning. Is there a non-obvious aspect to learning that you're a big fan of? Or is there something you're driving towards in this area? Do either of those questions apply to this kind of, you know, passion? Um, well... I think I think that it is always important to to keep an open mind in that you know the things that you don't get trapped into thinking that anything has an absolute truth or at least not one that you can figure out um, and uh, I always have to be careful to to check myself uh you know, to make sure that I'm not letting my, you know, my preconceived notions based on the time I've already put in is preventing me from, you know, learning something new. Hmm. That was a really good way to kind of put a bottle cap on that. So moving on from the beautiful and the passionate to the preposterous and the peeveful, which isn't a word. What is your preposterous peeve, Dan? Right. So th- this is something that really p- pisses me off. Um, I I really hate that the English language does not have a a good word for either of the first two sets of ten in in our number system, right? If You're something happened, need to in, explain that. A little right, bit. <laughs> right, right, right. Sure. I mean, so the, you know, the most obvious way that this comes up in people's day to day lives, you know. We love reminiscing about the 90s, right? And the 80s, so much cool stuff happened. And then and then the year 2000 hit and we have the aughts. No one <laughs> no, 
no one even said that, right? I mean, the that entire decade, people kind of awkwardly phrased like, oh, the 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 beginning of the century or the the <laughs> the the and then and 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 then but what, what's even worse is the second set because you, you know you have the teens the the decade that we just wrapped up but that 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 one's even worse because <laughs> no one no one knows how to say that first decade right the second mm-hmm. one people you know they know the word right it's the teens but like that's not really right you know i don't think that <laughs> I don't think that academics are going to put that in 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 their in their books, and it's just I mean it it is it's frankly preposterous to me that we have not found a better way to do this because it impacts every single English speaking person's <laughs> life at some point, and at times probably causes like legitimate professional or academic confusion. Yeah, I mean it nearly caused Y two K, right? It's just outrageous. Uh, no. No, that, that, <laughs> that most certainly did not almost cause Y2K. The computers were just like, how do we, it's not 2000s, we only have two digits. <laughs> uh, that, that's funny. What Do you have a proposed fix? Or is um, it just, is it just fucked and needs to be fixed? Um, I propose that we call them uh, the first Zs and the second Zs. <laughs> Because who doesn't love a good Z? Uh, I, I guess second Zs would be confusing with twenties. The 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 zero Zs and the first Zs. <laughs> I mean, I know that that doesn't roll off the tongue necessarily, but it's 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 a it, it's a good mile better it's than what start. we have now, <laughs> and they're fun. They're fun words, you know. Yeah. All right. Well. Uh, we already took our first or our zero Z's <laughs> ad break. We're going to take our first Z's <laughs> ad break. Now I feel like you're making this intentionally confusing. <laughs> Please come back after the first Z's <laughs> ad break. Where we're going to introduce Dan to the lightning round. See you in a bit. Have you ever wanted to kill a small woodland creature or break a window, but not have the physical strength? I know I have. Now introducing Rock. Rock comes in a variation of sizes and ready to use. Simply put Rock in your hand, raise it back to ear level, and release. See? You've got it! This ad does not condone the violence against small woodland creatures or windows, nor will it be held liable for any inability of use when coming into contact with paper. And we're back. Dan, are you ready to enter the lightning round? As ready as anyone can ever be to do something with that name. (laughs) Okay. Well, let's put as much time on the clock as it requires to finish this. Dan, is there a god? No. Shakira's voice in Danny DeVito's body or Danny DeVito's voice in Shakira's body? The second one. Wine or beer? Wine. Are hot dogs sandwiches? Yes. You're having the best day of your life. What happens next? Another amazing thing or something terrible? Oh, another amazing thing. Lions, tigers, or bears? Bears. Is zero a number? Yes. Caffeine or alcohol? (sighs) Alcohol. Wish I could say caffeine. Bow tie or suspenders? Bow tie. Have you ever paid more for a meal than you made in a week? No. Neapolitan or Spumoni? Spumoni. No one's looking. Do you put the cart back or leave it in the parking lot? I put it back. If you had the power to see the future but couldn't change it, would you use it? Yes. Over or under? Oh, you always take the over. Pineapple on pizza or fist fight? Pineapple on pizza. Not close. Can billionaires be ethical? Yes. Kill the spider or get an adult? Kill the spider. I am, unfortunately, the adult in my household. (laughs) Red or blue? Blue. Is there a price for you to give up your passion forever? No. Salsa or Lindy Hop? I don't know what Lindy Hop is. I'm going salsa. (laughs) Dog or cat? 
cat. Which one of your parents settled? Uh, my mom. Sunny side up, scrambled, or hard boiled? Um, hard boiled. Which do you max out first? Intelligence, charisma, or strength? Charisma. Did you ever cheat on a test in school? Yes. Would you rather have your inner monologue sound like Gilbert Gottfried or Fran Drescher? Fran Drescher. Popsicle or Klondike bar? Popsicle. Are Cheez-Its addicting? Yes. Are we alone in the universe? No. Pizza or pasta? Pizza. All right, congratulations, Dan. You've survived the lightning round. What lightning round <laughs> question would you like to ask me and in turn be asked of future guests? I don't remember, Isaac. I don't remember what we settled on. Do you have it? I do. <laughs> Your question was, would you rather give up cheese or naps? Oh, yep. A great question. You... And I would rather give up naps because I don't nap well. So it's a bit of a bit of an easy cheatsy answer there for me yeah i mean the 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 losing cheese would affect you on more days but on those days where you where the nap cost you that is a far graver price to pay true that but you know it, it it's no you never bet on zero <laughs> you're clearly not a degenerate gambler <laughs> you've got half that right all right Anything you want to plug, recommend, or places people could find you or your content? Um, your Twitter, for instance, Instagram. N- no, uh, can I? Can I? Can I uh, plug my girlfriend's Instagram? Sure. All right. Uh, please check out my wonderful girlfriend's Instagram. Uh, she is at the number two. The crayonist. So, like, one who works with crayons. I'm sure we'll also put it in the description if you want to find that. Please. Um, Well, thanks, Dan, for being my guest today. And special thanks to my editor, Richard Ashford, and my composer, Joshua Gibbons. And especially thank you, everybody listening at home or wherever you found the time to appreciate this. And if you want to listen to more, you can find more episodes put out every Monday at midnight on SoundCloud at Passionate People and Preposterous Peeves or on YouTube at Passionate People and Preposterous Peeps Podcast, all one word with an ampersand in the middle. And if you like this, please like, share, subscribe, do whatever you want. Everything helps and is appreciated. And remember, folks, you stick your left foot in, you pull your left foot out, and then the attendant shakes their finger at you all about, because that isn't how you ride an elevator. Have a great day.